American farmers are baling nearly 50 million tons of hay a year. Twine to bale this and other profitable crops is one of the most essential of farm supplies. Twine by the millions of miles. Twine available when and where the farmer needs it. Quality twine the farmer can rely on. Where does this vast supply of twine come from? To begin with, harvest twines, rope, and other hard fiber cordage products are made from one of three basic vegetable fibers, abaca, sisalana, and hennigan. Of the millions of varieties of plants grown throughout the world, the fibers from these three are best suited for cordage purposes. But because of climate and soil conditions, none of them can be grown in this country. The abaca plant, which produces a fiber commonly known as manila and is used primarily for making rope, comes from the Philippines and Central America. Here's a plantation in the Philippines. Some plantations are large, like this one, but more are small family farms. The mature plants, which closely resemble the banana tree, are first cut down, then the unusable tops and bottoms are lopped off the stalk and discarded. Next comes an operation called tuxying, which is a good deal more complicated than it looks. Individual layers are carefully stripped from the stalk by an experienced farmhand who knows just how and where to cut. Each layer contains only a few of the strong, tough manila fibers, but they are the finest natural fibers found anywhere in the world for rope making. The tuxes are made up into bundles of 100 and hauled to the stripping shed. Here the operator winds the tuxes around a spindle and pulls them over a serrated knife. This scrapes off the pulpy waste material, which is more than 90% of the tuxi, and leaves the prized abaca fibers long, strong, and ready for curing. After a day in the sun, the fiber is carried by that standard Philippine conveyance, the water buffalo cart, or sometimes by more modern means to warehouses in nearby seaports for weighing, grading, and storage to await shipment to the United States. The other two cordage fibers, Sisalana and Hennigan, are generally similar in appearance. However, Sisalana fibers are longer, stronger, smoother, and make up into more uniform, trouble-free twine than Hennigan. Since it is more economical than Manila for the farmer, the U.S. cordage industry uses Sisalana exclusively for baler twine. Hennigan, weakest of the three fibers, is used in making binder twine where not so much strength is needed. Sisalana is grown in the tropics, Africa, Haiti, Brazil, and other parts of Latin America. Hennigan is grown in Mexico and Cuba. The tremendous demand for twine requires large plantations and processing plants. Locations are selected for the quality of the soil, loose, rich in lime, naturally fertile. Planting is all handwork with a grub hole. That's something we don't see on our mechanized farms. But different crops require different methods. The young plants are suckers cut from the roots of mature sisalana plants. Embedded in holes about six inches deep, the suckers will use their first year to send long roots into the rich loam. After a year and a half, their leaf growth has started, and the plants, a variety of cactus, look larger and healthier. After two and a half years, the plants are ready for harvesting. Two and a half years. By our farm standards, that's a long time to wait for a cash crop. Workers with razor-sharp knives harvest the mature lower leaves, leaving the newer upper leaves on the plant to ripen. Cutting just the prime ripe leaves is the only way to get the high-grade sisalana that U.S. cordage mills will accept. And now the sisalana farmer, like the American grain farmer, sends his product off to the processing plant. From the sidings to the main line, to join the harvest from other parts of the plantation. Music 
At the plant, the bundles are untied and spread evenly onto a conveyor belt to be fed into the decorticator. Here is one type of decorticator, a complex machine for recovering the fibers from the leaves, or rather for removing the useless parts of the leaves from the fibers. The decorticator works by first mashing and peeling off the rubbery outer skin, then crushing the pulp into a loose, soft mass and scraping it away. Inside the machine, huge streams of water wash away the loose pulp, leaving clean, washed fiber, strong, smooth, pliable. It may have looked simple, but it took years of research and a good deal of money to design machines and train operators to produce this clean, quality fiber. As with tobacco, twine fibers must be cured before shipping. A day in the hot tropical sun will dry and bleach the fiber from pale green to white. After just the right amount of drying, the fiber is baled and sent to waiting cargo vessels for shipment to the United States. Then to an American cordage mill by rail or truck. Here, inspection begins all over again. Although that fiber was all classified before it left the tropics, it must be reinspected and graded by U.S. cordage inspectors before any of it will be accepted for manufacture. It may all look the same to us, but these men have had years of experience in this business. They know fiber. They know the best fiber only will make top quality twine. This inspection is the first of a series of quality control operations rigidly followed in U.S. mills. Twine manufacture begins with the selection, preparation, and blending of the raw materials. For binder twine, Henneken is adequate. But for baler twine, only 100% strong, tough sisalana is used. The raw fibers are spread evenly on a conveyor belt and sprayed with an oil and chemical emulsion to lubricate the fibers, to make them more pliable, and to make the finished twine mildew, rodent, and rot resistant. Important considerations to twine in the field and in the barn. The stream of treated fiber is passed between corrugated rollers to distribute the emulsion evenly. Manufacturing quality control begins right here. To make twine of uniform diameter throughout, the fiber must be fed to the breaker at a uniform rate, controlled by weighing it as it is carried into the machine. Pins on the right moving faster than those on the left begin to comb out the fiber and stagger the ends. The result is a uniform, continuous ribbon of fiber known as a sliver. But one combing isn't enough. The sliver will be combed and recombed, each time becoming smoother, glossier, more uniform. Each time the sliver goes through a breaker, it is blended and combed with other slivers. This is part of the unique American method of preparation to guarantee that every foot of finished twine will possess identical properties, uniformity, high tensile strength, and greater length, all necessary to economical baling. Again, each manufacturing step is checked by quality control. An inspector selects slivers from each machine at random. 100 feet are measured out and weighed to test for uniformity. And now having passed the first weighing inspection to the draw frame for finishing the sliver. When they leave this operation, the finished slivers are smooth, lustrous, and even. Uniform slivers make uniform twine. No thin spots to break later. No thick spots to jam in the baler's needle or knotter. Strength, uniformity, maximum length, and low cost. These are the standards that pay off for the American farmer in handling and storage. These are the standards that pay off in minimum field stops. These are the standards that pay off in farm profits. Spinning is the next operation. This is where the sliver is turned into twine. Twelve clean, strong, uniform, treated slivers are fed into the gill spinner and twisted 12 times per foot under high uniform tension. This twist compresses the individual fibers so the spaced ends cannot pull apart. No matter how fine the twine, it won't help the farmer unless it feeds freely in the baler to the last foot. That's where a compact, evenly wound ball comes in.
high-speed balling machines wind up smoothly with a diagonal wind and automatically stop when the ball is full. But we're not finished yet. The most exacting quality control inspections come with the finished product. A regular percentage of the balls of twine are completely unwound and laid out on this rack so that the inspector may visually examine the entire ball to ensure there is no unevenness or other defect. An equally important test is for tensile strength. Twine made from Sisalana tests on an average of 50 pounds more than that made from Henneken. That's why U.S. mills use Sisalana and Sisalana only for baler twine. And every completed ball of twine is weighed before packing to guarantee the farmer will get full measure for his money. cordage industry plans production schedules months ahead in order to keep the mills busy all year round. This helps to keep down the cost of twine. Modern U.S. manufacturing and handling methods mean efficient production. This helps to keep down the cost of twine. Sturdy packaging means safe delivery to warehouses near America's great farms, so there will be no delay in supplying farmers promptly during the peak haying season. This too helps to keep down the cost of twine. Progressive farmers spend thousands of hours and thousands of dollars in planning, in labor, in the finest of mechanized equipment to make American farms the most productive in the world. They need and deserve the best of equipment and supplies. The U.S. cordage industry is doing its part in supplying reliable, economical twine. Twine that runs free through the baler, that bales without snagging, that knots without snarling that keeps the bales secure in the field or barn until needed, that resists rot, rodents, and mildew, and handles without breaking. Every foot of U.S.-made baler twine is made to hold bales of 50, 60, 70 pounds, even more if the moisture content of the hay is high. The chemical emulsion, which we saw treating the raw fiber, will keep these bales intact through the winter. But this is not the end of the twine story. Forward-looking cordage men are constantly seeking ways to improve the product. New materials, new blends, new methods of manufacturing are being explored and tested by the industry. To date, no adequate substitute has been found that has the advantages of strength, long life, and the low cost of Sisalana. But research laboratories are continuing to provide this progressive industry with facts, information, and possible future developments, not only in baler and binder twine, but in other cordage products. As examples, these products are made of nylon, dacron, orlon, fiberglass, each for a special purpose. But manila is the fiber most used in rope making. Manila fiber is treated, combed into slivers, and spun exactly as with twine, except that here it is called yarn to distinguish it from twine. The size, composition, and number of yarns is determined by the character of rope to be made. Here, a number of yarns are being spun to form a strand. And three strands are being twisted together to form rope. Our mills make a wide variety of rope because each job demands something different of it. For instance, there's wheat pouring into a grain elevator. And there it is being handled by a scoop operated with a manila shovel line. Rope helps the farmer market his wheat. Here it's branding time. That lariat is starting meat on its long journey toward the dinner table. Try to figure this job without rope. Fish too. These are menhaden, which will be converted into farm fertilizer.
power. Power brought to homes, farms, and factories with the aid of rope. Mooring lines, the giant hawsers that hold ocean liners. Let's not forget sports and recreation. We wish we knew the number of mountain climbers' lives that have been saved by rope. But of course, defense requirements receive first priorities. There is no substitute for rope in the many applications of the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. Alongside the obvious materials like copper, uranium, or rubber, manila and sisalana fibers have been classified as a strategic material by the Department of Defense. This means that millions of pounds of prime manila and sisalana are being stockpiled in government warehouses, earmarked for priority needs like stretcher rigging to save lives or cargo nets to supply ships. But unlike permanent materials, manila and sisalana are vegetable fibers. They cannot be stored away and forgotten. So the cordage industry is doing its part in national defense by rotating the stockpile. That is, keeping the government supplied with new fiber so that this strategic material will be there when it is needed. And there's no more strategic use for the products of cordage fiber than on the farm. Prosperous agriculture is just as important as prosperous industry to the strength of the United States. Strength through prosperity. Prosperity through thoughtful farm planning, productive labor, and efficient and reliable farm equipment and supplies.